welcome everyone and welcome back to another episode here in Singapore, day one of our event. I am Claudio Gennaro, I will be your host for today and I have uh, more guests uh, for this other episode here. Let's see, late Lee Francis from Irrational Agency. I was saying before that's a really nice name for, for an agency. Thank you very much. Can you tell us something about yourself, who wants to start and about what you do at Irrational? Uh, why don't I start? So I uh, am the founder at Irrational Agency, started it in 2012. Uh, I'm a behavioral scientist and uh, i also a mathematician. And uh, so I founded the agency to bring some of the secrets of unconscious behavior and psychology and behavioral science into the market research world and uh, using mathematics to model them so we could do it all quantitatively. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm joined here by uh, Francis, who's a colleague of mine, and Lizzie, who uh, is or was a client of ours until very recently. And uh, so, um, Lizzie, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Lizzie. I used to work at um, Vodafone in the UK as um, head researcher of their products and services division. But I've worked with Lee, I think it's about 10 years now. I think we've got 10 year anniversary coming up. <laughs> um, so I first started working with Lee and Irrational when I was at IHG. And um, yeah, that's how long, that's, yeah, it feels a long time now. Mm. But yeah, I, I, it, the reason I now no longer work with Lee is because I've just left Vodafone and have just now moved to Singapore. So I am available for work. <laughs> if I want to be, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> Good. And Francis? Um, I'm Francis. Uh, I work with Lee at Rational. Um, I'm a behavioural science researcher and senior research executive there. Work day to day on behavioralizing traditional market research uh, methods and we use behavioural science throughout our research projects with different clients and work on improving those methods uh, day to day. So I'm totally in the darkness when it comes to behaviour applied to market research. Can you tell me something about that? How does it work? Well, um, <clears throat> behavioral science is all about uncovering the, the unconscious aspects of human decision making. So everybody has got uh, things going on in their brain that are um, under the surface that you don't really know about. And so traditional market research, you ask people questions, say, tell me, would you do you like this product or tell me about uh, how much do you recycle? Um, but that only accesses the, the top part, the conscious part of people's brain. And uh, so behavioral methods are all about getting to the, the secrets that are hidden underneath the things that people don't know or they can't tell you if you just ask in a survey. And so we use all sorts of methods, both qualitative methods where we um, ask questions in a certain way to uncover the things that from people's past or the, the dreams or the, the um, thoughts that they have that they don't know. Or we use um, online methods to get people's unconscious reactions to different stimulus, different pictures, different words, and uh, find out their, some of their secrets. Um, <clears throat> Francis is actually here because he's um, developed a project about testing different types of research methods to see which ones are more effective. And so he's, he's competing in the Young SMR um, Award. He's uh, nominated for that. So do you want to tell us about that project? Yeah, so as you say, so we have a number of different behavioral science methods which we used. And uh, so what, what I did with um, my recent project is to test a lot of those different methods. Um, and that involved testing five different methods within a survey. Um, and what we did to test those is we actually brought uh, behavior into the survey. So what that meant is putting adverts, which we sell to customers in the survey. Um, so usually when you put a survey to customers, you just ask them, would they buy the product? And that's the end of it. Um, you get a 70% appeal score and then you, you put it to the client. But uh, here we actually have the advert so we can see their claim results for the different methods, um, whether they found it really appealing, but we can also see, well, did they actually go on to buy it? And that, al uh, that allowed us to look at the relationship between their claimed survey results, what they said they would do, and the actual behavior of whether they bought it or not. Um, and so we think it, offer, it can offer more insight by bringing that behavior into, into the research. And Lizzie, are we from the client side, yes. Uh, yeah, we're Lizzie and I are presenting tomorrow about mm -hmm. some uh, new stuff we developed at Vodafone, a new innovation process. So mm -hmm. uh, Lizzie can tell you something about that. Yeah, so I joined Vodafone in 2020, and um, it was a very traditional type of research where, despite the fact we were asking customers about products that didn't even exist yet, mm -hmm. we were trying we were trying to um, sell stuff at 
we tried to explain in like two sentences and just hope they instantly understood it, then we would in effect say, how likely are you to buy it? And we and Vodafone would in the main take that data at face value. So when I kind of came into Vodafone, I thought that's insane because you can see by looking at previous studies where um, you know Vodafone has launched products that have been very unsuccessful despite the market research saying this will be successful. And I suspect vice versa, that some very potential products have been killed because mm-hmm. market research said, no, we don't think customers will buy it. Whereas actually maybe they would if it was marketed or communicated in the right way. So I think taking a behavioral approach when you're trying to sell something that doesn't exist is really important to try and get both of that conscious, but actually those unconscious motivations and really understanding your customer helps you have more confidence in potential new products and services that will hopefully make the company money. That's what it's all about. So without having to uh, tell any company secrets to everyone, how do you yeah. uncover hidden behaviors? Yeah. Well, what are some, some methodologies that we can apply? Um, <clears throat> well, we've got we've got three. <coughs> pardon me. Um, we got cold coffee. No, I some, <laughs> I'm all right. Thanks. Um, we've got three things we're going to talk about tomorrow, and that, that we worked with um, Vodafone on. One of them is this idea of narrative qual. So qualitative research often is about asking questions, uh, but instead we uh, get people to tell stories. So if they tell a story about their lives, a story about the, um, you know, how they use their mobile phone, uh, and we might share some stories with them to help them to open up, we, we find that people reveal a lot more in storytelling than they do in questions. Um, and then on the quantitative side, we use uh, a tool, among other things, a tool called System 3. And System 3 is our way of uh, getting people to reveal the unconscious associations that they have, which in turn drive how they see the world and they, they drive the, um, the models of the, the mental model of the world that people have, the, the narratives that they have, the stories that they tell. And um, we, uh, we use System 3 to uncover their, how they imagine the world and how they imagine, for example, the role of, that a new product could play in their lives. That's System 3. That's right. How about System 1 and 2? So System 1 and 2, many listeners might be familiar with um, books like Thinking Fast and Slow from mm-hmm. Daniel Kahneman, where he's explored uh, the what he calls System 1, the unconscious mind, and System 2, which is the, the logical mind that, that follows the rules of mathematics and arithmetic. Um, we think that those two only cover part of the, the brain, and there's a, there's a third area, which is how people use their imaginations, how they tell stories. And um, we think that you need new tools and a, and a new model to understand that, and that's what we call System 3. Yeah, exactly. So uh, system one it's, it's more about quick uh, quick decisions that you'd make instinctively um, rather than like rational decisions which you'd take time over deliberate over um, and system three is really as a response to to looking at that model um, and what can be added to it in decision in decision making so there's certain decisions which don't necessarily fall into this system one which is is quick decisions neither do they fall into like this longer deliberation there's a kind of when people make decisions, they, um, the imagination aspect to it of imagining how they would use this product in a different scenario. Um, and so um, at the company, we're able to like tap into another kind of aspect of decision making, which isn't covered by those first two models, which is well known in, which are well known in behavioral science, um, like more broadly uh, within the industry. There's no system for Oh, well, not yet. We'll, yeah. we'll leave that to the, <laughs> the next generation of researchers to uh, discover. Lee's working on that. My question is, <laughs> coming from a mathematical background, how does it help understanding these certain behaviors? Um, so mathematics is very useful in a couple of ways. So all, all researchers use mathematics in statistical analysis, um, at least if you're, if you're doing quantitative analysis. So there are some well-known tools for uh, looking at uh, comparing to uh, different groups of people, see if there's a statistically significant differences between them, uh, and many researchers will be familiar with that. Mathematics also allows us to build models, to build formal models of certain um, hypotheses you might have. So this, this idea about imagination, you could talk about imagination 
in a very conversational way. You could say, well, people's imagination is, is creative, it's, uh, it's colourful, it's got images of the world. But you could also think mathematically, well, how would we measure the structure of imagination? Um, and that's what then allows you to uh, access it in a more quantitative and a, and a more uh, rigorous way. And so we draw imagination out as a kind of a, a graph. It looks a bit like a mind map if you've uh, been, if you've heard of mind maps uh, mm-hmm. with different concepts and the connections between different concepts. Uh, and mathematics allows you to uh, build that model and to therefore um, measure and understand imagination or stories or narratives in a way that you wouldn't be able to do just from a conversational basis. Anything you want to add? Um, just on um, on system three, the way I sort of understood uh, system three and came to know it and work with System three is kind of when you're in that moment of making a decision, um, being able to think about the future um, through imagination um, to kind of visualize how that decision would would impact you um, kind of later down the line. Yeah. I think from a client Mm. point of view, does, <clears throat> do you find that mathematics and numbers make yes. it easier to sell an idea? Oh internally? my God, yes. So I would say probably with the exception of, I mean, slightly stereotypical here, apologies, but almost your marketing teams will love the narrative and the stories and the videos and the bringing the consumer to life. Your commercial and your product managers want robust numbers that they can put into a business case and have confidence that the um, huge amounts of money that they're going to invest in a product and ultimately in marketing as well, will succeed so absolutely the number of projects that we've all as you know only too well where we've almost got had the answers from the qual mm. but we've had to do quantitative to tick the stakeholder box it's been really important and sometimes it has been a bit of a right we know the qual is right but we're going to do this just to help get that embedded in the organization and sometimes the big pieces like system free or indeed going straight to something like a behavioral conjoin has taken us straight to those kind of numbers there's no doubt about it. Numbers make people feel more confident about using inside research to make decisions. And can I ask a question? Mm, yeah. You may. So, <laughs> um, so that that need for numbers is that down to they need to show someone the the that they're working with to like prove what they believe in. So I think they say, like, I'm on board with you, but I need a graph to show to someone, yes. or I need I need something that shows is, this number. I, don't, I like, think it took me quite yeah. a while in clients I to realise, even if you think you're working with someone senior, they've yeah. got someone more senior that who will know very little about the ins and outs of the project. So the people who are actually working on the project will probably be really comfortable with something like qualitative and go, it feels right. That's great, it doesn't help sell it if you need to go to the board and, and you can give them two minutes to go yes or no to investment funds. So yeah, absolutely. Every every some, every senior person has got someone else more senior that they need to convince. And numbers that go, big numbers, but say yes, do this, are much easier than, well, people sort of say that they, you know, those kind of, yeah. those qualitative insights that are so critical in the actual implementation, but in terms of actually getting a go, no go decision mm. are really critical. Yeah. I often think that when sort of composing, working on the project, yeah. composing the report, when you've got like deep qualitative insights and thinking, are these going to get lost when it goes to that senior level? Yeah. When they see that report, no, they won't understand the full context, the full, yeah. the full qualitative insight it's that you put not, into it and yeah. what, what they would. Yeah. It, it sometimes yeah. can be a bit depressing when you see all that hard work yeah, and yeah. all that nuance distilled in One three side, numbers. Yeah. But to be fair, if it gets it through, then actually that doesn't matter. And almost I have to kind of slightly remove myself from that almost, you know, the bias that I've got from all the investment. But no, you should know about this and you should know about that. Actually, it doesn't matter. If the person who needs to make the decision makes the decision and then the rest of the team are empowered by the insight to um, implement it in the best possible way to maximize the success, then fine. That's a great tip with, for, for dealing with, with client sites, how to present the project, right? Mm. So it really makes it really makes a lot of sense. I guess it's really helpful to to know how it's perceived and what are the, the, the key information that yeah. needs to be Yeah, to be and received. you can actually use a little bit. We, we had a webinar recently called Selling Insights where we talked about using behavioral science 
on your stakeholders because your stakeholders are consumers like everyone else. They have their own psychology and their own unconscious um, biases. And if you can use, for example, the what's called the authority bias, where, well, a scientist said this, so it must be true, then um, <laughs> it, go, it can go a long way to making people believe what you're saying. Okay, we need to talk about AI. Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, well, let's, let's, get the, let's get the next set of guests in there. <laughs> Something we are we're always yeah. asking. How, yeah. you, how are you implementing or did you implement mm. any kind of AI in your daily activity? There's one, well, Francis, yeah. do you want to talk about your project first? Yeah, so <clears throat> we've got an example of the way we use AI in the recent project that I mentioned earlier that we're, we're testing. So that's in, we did a sentiment analysis. We basically take um, a series of open-end comments from respondents. Yeah, 100 different comments, different talking about different things. Um, and obviously, there's no numerical score on that. So there are like AI tools you can use to turn that into a numerical score um, in terms of their sentiment. So it would put a different um, like way to if they say, this product's incredible, I would definitely buy it, that would be... At 0.9 out of between zero and one on the scale, and then you know maybe I would buy it. Might be like 0.5, for example. So there's AI tools that can do that quite rapidly. Where pre previously you have to, well, in in other ways doing it without AI, you have to use like um, lexicon like models. It's quite time consuming to use. Mm -hmm. um, so it can help quicken up that process. Um, yeah. Mm. What I'm interested in is almost use it, almost getting into the psychology of the AI. So mm -hmm. treat the AI as if it was a person and see what's the unconscious mind of the AI going to do. Um, and if we can then teach the AI to think more like a person by saying, okay, we, we surveyed a thousand people, we got into their unconscious mind. We're going to program the AI to take those insights and then we can get the AI to act like a person. Uh, to act like one of, say, a Vodafone um, consumer or, or subscriber and say to the AI, well, now tell us what would that person do in this new situation? Um, do, you know, uh, do you know if Vodafone had been doing any AI experiments? We're talking about synthetic data. Well, so kind of synthetic data, but built from real people's mm -hmm. data. So, yeah, programmed, pro taking the real people to make the synthetic model. I think Vodafone was starting to look at it in the core business, less so in products and services. I think it was still very early days. I think we probably depended more on almost working with agencies who were offering AI tools. So there was certainly a little bit of experimentation, nothing that has revolutionized or dramatically changed our, the approach that Vodafone, that the part of Vodafone I was working with was using. But I think there, I'm sure there will be. Mm. I have actually used um, some AI to create the images for tomorrow's presentation. So um, we've got a, a few, uh, uh, actually I haven't shown you this, Lizzie, <laughs> yeah. but we've, I've made a rendering of you as the, the hero of our, of our journey fighting the monsters. Oh my God, I website. love AI already. I mean, yes, my main use of AI is actually rewriting very badly written concepts from my <laughs> stakeholders. So less for research, more for um improving what should be should be bread and butter for some of my <laughs> stakeholders yeah. so actually it's been it has been very useful but yeah probably not in the way that um, <laughs> it will be in maybe yeah. a year to two years yeah and we another use for it that we have at the company not specifically within project work but note taking mm. in kind of from meetings you can get the ai ai to do that i think they've, they've actually now integrated it within zoom there are other platforms that do it um like create like summaries and next mm. steps to mm. do um you, you can imagine using that in actually like research with qualitative um research but um based on some of the ai results we've had from the meetings i don't know how successful that would be <laughs> uh, probably about 80 or 90 percent yeah. to be fair um sometimes when you get a person to take the notes from the meeting they only get 80 percent right yes, anyway so you true. know it's not true. really much worse yeah i think they get it wrong kind of in a, in a different way that's true yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> Is there any, any specific tool that you wish you had and you don't have yet when it comes to AI? Ooh. I think, well, <clears throat> you're asking us to invent the next uh, AI startup here. And, it's uh, copy we copyright it. <clears throat> well, yeah, we, maybe we should keep that to ourselves. Yeah. Instead of yeah. like giving away our, our ideas to all of them. It's yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I would, um, I think I would like um, 
I would actually like to put an AI into the hands of some clients so that when they ask a research question, um, it will, first it will find if they already have the answer in their existing library. Because, you know, yes. as, as you will know, there yeah. could be hundreds yes. of studies yes. in a client that um, <clears throat> already answer a lot of questions. But then it will tell them, okay, here's the gaps where you could do with more data. And uh, then it would come to us with that gap and say, here's exactly what you need to, the gap you need to fill to help this client. So that would be a nice way of um, helping, the, helping the client to work with what they already have and enhance it with the extra insights that we could provide. Yeah. I think it's, sometimes with those, uh, with those tools, it's kind of a be careful what you wish for situation mm -hmm. because um, I've been doing reports and I've really wanted, oh, I wish an AI could kind of finish this report off or get the ideas in my mind down on the, uh, and into the report. But you, then you don't want to give away too much power to the AI because I kind of happy in my job, <laughs> laying it out myself, and I don't want the AI to take over my role. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Easily, yeah. Francis, thanks a lot for joining. Yeah, Best of you. luck for your participation to the Young SMR Society Awards. Yeah. Thank you. And thank hope you, you will much. enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah. Lovely to meet you. Thanks sure. a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. <coughs> 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 Did you like it? Oh, oh yeah. Well, there you go. Have you got the app?